So we've got our recording started. We've got our artist geared up and ready to go. So I wanna welcome everyone to the virtual mother of all pottery sales. This is the final of six artist demos and talks and we're going out in a very big way with of course, our former artist in residence, Eva Conrad. Thank you for, for being here, both Eva and everyone. Um, during Eva's artist talk, we're gonna ask folks to stay on mute. If you do have questions that pop up, please put them in the chat. I'll watch it and sort of hold those questions until Eva has finished, and then she'll jump in and start responding to questions. Of course, if you have a technical question, put it in and I'll try to help you um, troubleshoot it. Um, my name is Michelle Kless. I'm the deputy director here at Union Project in Pittsburgh. Union Project is a nonprofit arts organization uh, founded in 2001. During our short nonprofit lifespan, we've served the community in many different ways, constantly evolving with, with what the community needs and is interested in. Um, most notably, we're famous for restoring 155 original stained glass windows in our building. We have also created space for hundreds of community events and celebrations. And because we are in a historic 100 plus year old building, we have renovated and are dedicated to the constant maintenance of that building as a community asset. Our very biggest program focus is ceramics. We offer classes, workshops, group programs, kiln rental, a membership program, all in our in-house ceramic studio, uh, geared toward creating opportunities for people of all ages, of all skill levels to learn and create in clay in a way that makes the most sense for them. Part of that programming is a huge annual celebration of clay. We hold it every year. It's the mother of all pottery sales. And of course, in 2020, we had to cancel it. When 2021 rolled around, we weren't really ready to host a big in-person event again, but we didn't want to hold off on that celebration. In past years, we've been fortunate to celebrate with as many as a thousand people coming in to watch artist demonstrations and try hands-on clay activities, and of course, purchase pottery from artists. Um, so rather than do in person, we crafted this slate of virtual programming. As I mentioned before, it's included six different artist demonstrations and talks from artists both locally like Eva and also not locally. Um, we've also put together an online shop for local pottery purchases, it's local pickup only. Um, and so I would encourage you, you have one more day, the shop closes tomorrow. So once Eva has wrapped today, go check it out. The uh, website is union-project.square.site. Um, I do wanna take a minute and thank uh, some sponsors and foundations. This event was made possible through their generous support. We are really grateful to the Fine Foundation, to Bridgeway Capital, to the Creative Business Accelerator, to Simpson & McCready, to Standard Ceramics. And in addition to those great groups, Union Project is also supported in part every year by the Allegheny Regional Asset District. Thank you to all of them. I'm so pleased to introduce our artist for today, Eva Conrad. Eva is a ceramicist and painter right here in Pittsburgh. Uh, her ceramic work includes both pottery and sculptural work and incorporates repetitive patterns, spatial understanding, and questions our perception of functionality. Uh, as I mentioned, Eva was the artist in residence at Union Project from 2019 to 2021. Um, as part of that residency, she has recently finished work on a video uh, explaining how to work with clay for very first time beginner folks coming into our studio. Uh, it's just been posted on Union Project's YouTube channel. It's a highly informative video. It's also really, really joyful, a little bit quirky um, in the very best possible way. We love it. I highly recommend giving that a watch. Uh, thank you, Eva, for being here. I'm going to hand you the reins. Well, thank you everybody for joining and I'm going to go ahead and get this presentation started and share my screen. Okay, so as it has been said, my name is Eva Conrad. Thank you for that introduction, Michelle, and 
Um, I am the most recent resident of Union Project and really glad to have the opportunity to kind of explain my evolution as, as it has gone on and um, my work with Clay um, over the past about five plus years now. Um, so yeah, here I go. So this is the first painting that I made that really felt like um, something that I fully resonated with. And I made it during the same semester of undergrad um, where I took my first ceramics class. And uh, I think what really led me into a new way of painting that felt a lot more comfortable was that I had this reliance um, on function that drew me away from leaning on preconceived ideas so much. So there was an automaticness that happened like a more tap into a subconscious that was happening um, through these processes and that carried into my painting um, because I was just focused on function when I was making ceramic things. And um, it allowed me to loosen up with having strict ideas and perceptions of what I was to be making and allowing the process to just sort of um, be the meaning for me and to be lost in that. And so here are some mugs that I made in the first hand building class that I made, my second ever clay class. Um, and these cups were a representation of this automatic process, um, which these drawings were uh, under glaze and slip um, drawings that were made while the clay was still wet, even prior to the mug being formed. And the idea with these was that I was trying to carry this automatic, loose, intuitive process into people's everyday lives with this mundane object that we use usually once a day when we drink our coffee. Um, so as I continued working with clay, I um, explored more representational symbols and kind of was trying to push beyond the meaning simply being um, that I could work intuitively and that there was something else that I was maybe trying to get at that was subconscious. And it was more than just trying to reach into the subconscious. And it was, there was a message that was trying to come along. And so I tried to use representational things to get across these messages and was exploring how representation could carry that forward. And um, yeah, just, playing with what I was trying to show and allowing the process to be intuitive, but also like seeing what symbols came up. Um, and at this point also with this painting, I was like exploring more of like a three dimensional surface. I had this tube of paint that I squeezed onto the canvas and I let the tube, the puddle of paint that was on the surface of this canvas fall off the canvas during the night that I showed this painting. And so it was like more of an interactive thing starting to happen, more of like a sculptural aspect to the paintings that was beginning to happen. And so with the clay work that I was doing, I was also trying to bridge this line and has continued to be definitely a theme of my work is you know blurring the line between what is clay and what is painting and what is two dimensional and what is three dimensional. And so here is a ceramic painting that I made out of a slab of porcelain um, that is made to hang on the wall, but really does like push and pull and allows, you know, clay to do all that it can do um, rather than a painting, which, you know, is obviously does not have the flexibility sometimes, um, but working in that two dimensional, three dimensional and pushing that. And this painting also like, was a point where I was trying to, you know, pull away from representation as being cues to meanings and really allowing like myself to just explore like a larger 2D space and seeing how I can be, how I can create illusions of depth and dimension in a 2D space and just really like exploring color and form. And this painting is called Deposit Unknown. And this was like around the same time that I started this Instagram journey of sharing my work. And, um, you know, it was very much themed in a time of like grab into the subconscious, you know, explore like 
things that aren't easily defined like color and form and explore those things and it's like was very much an aim at trying to pull out of the subconscious and be intuitive and automatic um, and exploring dimension as well. So this is what led me to my senior body of work um, at App State in Boone, North Carolina. Um, this is a photo of most of the exhibition that I did in my senior semester. Um, and this show I titled um, Space Has Three Dimension and the Fourth is Time. And I'm just gonna read the statement that I wrote for this body of work. This body of work is driven by questions and intuition. What is the nature of reality? How do I occupy and interact with space and assign specific functions to spaces? How do I understand the dimensionality of space? I share this inquiry with my audience by establishing points of curiosity, interaction, and discovery. Reality is the product of our personal perceptions and experiences. Relativity is just a way for two people to agree on what they see. This is a place to discover your relativity to spaces and how you exist with time and mass. So to kind of go in some of the details of how I explore these topics, um, here are some closer pictures and details from this exhibition. Um, I really realized in installing this work that installation is like a whole other step to my process. And playing with these things that I had make as if they're all objects was like a complete breakthrough for me. And, you know, here I do it with stacking paintings on the wall, stacking them on top of found objects, on top of cups, stacking cups on top of paintings. Um, and also the same thing with, with clay and paint I'm doing with materials is kind of blurring this line between what is what. I used um, clay to create paints and used raw clay on the canvases and then used paint in a way that mimicked the raw clay that's on the other canvas, built up three-dimensional surfaces and sealed that raw clay onto the space. And, you know, really it was just playing with the materials and, and questioning what their functions could be and how I could, you know, switch it up and, and blur that line. And definitely like was always interested in having like a curious aspect and um, having little like secrets that were there for people to discover and in interactive moments um, and, you know, using light as a, as a medium was a big part of that to intrigue people into spaces. And this is an example of another one of those little portals that I had there hidden, but um, these portals were a were kind of like a representation in a pause in time because I had thought about ceramics and clay in this way when I was so focused about thinking about time. I would I thought about how ceramics was sort of this like putting something in a kiln was sort of like at this time sped up process because clay naturally goes from being clay to being a rock to being clay and through these processes through millions and millions of years back and forth again and putting clay into a kiln is like speeding up the process of what would happen naturally over millions of of years um returning back to a rock and here i have this vessel that was made um for one recording the wet stage of the clay very obviously um, and then sealing it with acrylic medium, which is also a form of paint, um, allowed for the clay to never dry. And thus, like, I am pausing this clay's potential. It will never return back to a rock, theoretically. It will never, like, continue on the natural process that that is, like, its destiny as a natural material. And um, also using mica as this lens, which you know has its own connotations of being a young form of a rock, and um, this light that is like this intrigue, using that as a material. Um, and I had these throughout the whole exhibition as little moments of a pause of time. And here is another vessel that I created that has this kind of collage of different 
sets of those records of time, different forms of clay and material. At the end here, we have a piece of a coil of clay that's again um, sealed in acrylic medium so that it will never dry. And then a piece of mica that's fired in the kiln. There's oil paint, ink, acrylic, and then a piece of um, dried clay that sits on top of this slotted opening to this vessel. And this vessel set, sat on a pedestal next to a cup, which um, as I'm doing all of this painting and sculpture, functional objects were still like very much a part of what I was interested in and what I was doing. And um, this conversation with this cup coming into this um, brings the context of a sculpture into the cup and the context of the functionality of this material into the sculpture. And makes you think of a cup as more sculptural and makes you think of this um, ceramic vessel as a utilitarian object, which I was always trying to switch those, those functions and narratives about the materials um, and forms. And here is another cup that sits on top of a painting as sort of a sculptural extension of that painting. And Again, another cup sits at the base of this installation. On the bottom left, we see this green painting canvas flowing into the cup as if a liquid might flow into yours, which this, this painting would traditionally have been a two-dimensional painting. Um, and the painting is actually aimed to record a physical space that um, this canvas remained in for a matter of months as it sat in this drape mold that is the cardboard box that sits on top of that. For, you, for those of you that don't know what a drape mold is, it's like a way of creating a form with gravity with a slab of clay. So I did a similar thing with this canvas, um, put it in the drape mold, filled it with watered down paint and allowed that water to evaporate over the course of months. Um, and it really creates like an insane depth in this green area of this painting. And so then to bring back the context, this drape mold box sits on top of it. And then this vessel sits inside of that drape mold that is called the cone pact, which is basically another um, allusion to the time that's passed in the kiln and like what that time is representative of as all of these cones melt at a different temperature and live through the heat um, as they're already melted and all are just a record of a different point in time. And then on the back of this installation is another vessel that is um, an oval shape, which is a shape that I continually made because it was sort of elusive in the fact that you read it sort of like a painting because you mostly see one dimension of it but it is a contained space as well. And then this grid that um, encases this book in this piece of furniture, almost as if it's like a two dimensional veil. And inside of the furniture is this book of poetry where it's opened up to this poem called the third dimension. And this poem is held, this book is held open to this poem with a piece of ceramic. Um, that then links you to another piece where that piece of ceramic came off of this piece that sits behind this jutting out corner of this painting, where on the back side of this corner that is shown through this jutting out, that poem, The Third Dimension, is written on the back of that painting. And there's more shards of the ceramic underneath the vessel um, in that uh, cement form that kind of cue you into the fact that there's this link here and you know these like discovery moments are things that you might not necessarily have picked up on if you saw this exhibition just one time but it's really like about having time to explore and exploring different things and seeing different things over the course of an experience with these objects and here's a little bit of a larger picture of this painting um it also was the one of the largest paintings that I had made, probably still to this date, it's like six by seven feet. Um, and this, this warping created this jutting out of the corner, which really added a lot. So, you know, pushing my abilities by creating something larger than I had um, 
allowed for these mistakes that really like fed into the concepts that I was playing with. And here is another um, monumentally large piece for my portfolio. It's about a 55 inch tall uh, ceramic tube vessel. Um, it is the sound tube is what it's called. Um, and inside of it, there is, well, on the outside, there is about over a hundred different holes. And this piece of twine leads through one of the holes where it becomes an interactive piece that you can pull the piece of twine. And this uh, mini cassette recorder will be pulled through up and down the tube. And you're able to hear the sound from the main opening at the top or through all of the little holes through throughout the whole vessel. And this mini cassette recorder is playing a loop of the first um, guitar riff that I ever wrote, which was again, kind of just like a record of this moment that was special to me that is then being drawn up and down through this interactive with, through this interactive experience with the viewer. Um, and this tube also carries into the secondary show that I had at um, the gallery that I was a member of that was kind of an extension of the show um, outside of the university exhibition that um, is a secondary tube that was another sound tube where it was like an even more interactive experience. It held a twine net that held another cassette recorder where there was sounds um, recorded that night and that day and then were continually recorded throughout the night. And so it really created a space of interaction, of play, of, of making sounds and was just like a very non-traditional gallery experience, really interactive. And the space also played a part in me exhibiting a more sculptural um, expression of cups where I had these series of cups that were entitled About a Cup, where, um, you know, these, these cups were literally about a cup. They weren't meant to be utilitarianly perfect. They weren't meant to be easy to use. They were meant about, they were meant to be a functional sculpture that you were able to use and live with and to bring um, an exploration of color and form into your mundane needs of drinking water or coffee on a normal day. And, you know, these also became like compositions and paintings as they were recorded in photographs um and yeah this was that was the exploration of cups that was exhibited and then this was a painting that I did after that kind of conclusion of me graduating from school still a member at the nth gallery at this point and was really just like looking to question and push my process and I really I had been writing about including found objects in my work, but it hadn't happened yet. And at this point, I was just kind of like, I'm including these found objects in my work now and really pushed for a more 3D surface in my painting and began using like physical objects that were representations of the patterns and symbols that I was including in my paintings um, and you know, hit a new boundary and became more um, representational in some ways, um, but still pretty abstracted and continued also um, exploring this sculptural functional cup um, and, you know, getting into more muted tones and just like seeing what this sculptural cup could offer. And this is a painting that I made at the Union Project. So after leaving Boone, I moved to Pittsburgh to complete this residency at the Union Project. And this was the most, is the most urban space that I've lived in in my life. And, you know, there was major shifts that came with that. And, you know, moving to a city by myself, moving out of the state by myself for the first time. And this painting incorporated found objects and carried that on also like used patterns more heavily and it became a little bit more more busy and there's more energy there's like a faster motion about this painting um and yeah just more present in the in the patterns that I was using and then here's a cup that I made while at the union project um again continuing this like sculptural like 
3D drawing that was happening, really like using all the skills that I had in hand building and sometimes in throwing to uh, create this kind of like collage of different techniques and using, you know, pattern to really draw it back into the paintings and to fixate on like what these patterns were representational of. Um, and yeah, and just another painting that I made at the Union Project, um, still really obsessed with elusiveness and dimension mm -hmm. and using this kind of, these sort of looping things as in the, as sort of a reference to weaving, which is also a reference to the grid, which is like a reoccurring pattern and symbol in my work. And again, another sculpture that I made while at the Union Project. And this piece, I really dived into using pattern to create an elusive form and um, creating a lot of I really was like trying to dimensionally trick people's eyes. And if you can't tell this, this vessel is, you know, a little bit confusing to look at. You can't necessarily pick apart the contour of what the shape is, what the form is. And pattern really allowed me to do that. And so then COVID happened in the midst of my, um, residency and I moved out of the union project as they closed in Ames to stop the spread of COVID. Um, and I luckily had a friend and neighbor, uh, Tabitha, who was also a ceramic artist and had this basement space that was ready to be set up as a mini studio. And so I was able to use this space and keep making at a much slower pace and mostly in wet work, um, but it was a lifesaver um, nonetheless to continue making vessels and really started playing with like form more and the sculptural um, vessels that I was making. Uh, and this is a painting that I made during quarantine in my apartment, in my one bedroom apartment on the third floor of this building, first time living by myself, and this painting was like, really felt like an imploding of like, I am contained in this space and I'm thinking a lot about the outside space. And so this painting is like repeating these patterns. There's a literal net in it and this contained like breath space um, where there's all this busyness and lines connecting on the outside and this busyness really like allowed me to get something out. Um, and I, it was, it was like medium nauseating to me how busy this was, but I knew that it was like something that needed to come out and that there was a focus on this interior exterior space that I needed to explore. Um, and as I took my next steps into my next paintings around the same time I started this painting and, uh, you know, was really like, how can I do exactly what I, you know, really push my process from what I just did and what I just finished and what felt kind of different than what I, I had done before. And I aim to be more minimal and say more with less marks. Um, and, you know, still using three-dimensional pieces on these paintings, still like using this collage aspect and trying to allude to dimension um, in an illusion type of way and continued doing this and you know really was was entranced by the idea of netting as an, another extension of weaving another extension of the grid as a symbol um, and also in a time that felt very contained and Eventually I was able to return back to the Union Project studio and was able to begin the glazing process once again after months of only working on wet work and painting and really was like, what am, what am I trying to explore here? You know, picked up on a lot through exploring painting and carried these symbols and patterns into some of the functional wares that I was doing. 
and also began making sculptural vessels again and with a lot heavier of a focus on pattern and with focus on what these patterns were meaning. I was really trying to research and find some meaning behind why I was continually returning to these patterns. And through a research um, dive into the Wikipedia page of checkerboard pattern, um, I led through the striped pattern Wikipedia page and then eventually led into this page about dazzle camouflage, which I interestingly enough found out um, that my great grandfather was a part in designing for the Navy. They used these, um, these striped, alternating stripe patterns to create an illusion as ships were in the ocean for opposing, you know, battlers to not understand which direction or size the ship was, which direction it was going. And I felt like this was like oddly familiar and um, it, it was a way for me to add illusion, illusion and uh, a little bit of confusion and, and an ambiguity of dimension to my vessels. And I continued using these patterns and checkerboard and dazzle camouflage specifically and, and grids still um, became pretty, pretty big obsessions of mine and ways of decorating my vessels. And I realized through thinking about these patterns that they all sort of thrive off of this polarity all have an alternating you know two colors and it's very much this binary pattern um which at the same time of realizing this I was definitely in a place as many of us were where I was internally just really diving into like myself my mental health like my my intentions in my life and you know as as quarantine came it paused everything and allowed us all to reflect and um, also at the same time, this summer, the earth past summer, uh, you know, there was major uproar in social justice movements. And after the murder of George Floyd, like a lot of things came to the surface as far as the way that our, you know, our community is structured, the way that um, institutions are structured. And I became a lot more involved than I ever had in community work and community involvement and social justice and you know was reflecting on all of this heavily and really saw the, some link between like the binary polarity of these patterns and the ways that like binary sy systems were showing up in like these oppressive systems and um so I continued using these like alternating patterns in functional work and like processing their meaning and allowing their, the simple patterns to carry these like process, these thought processes into these mundane objects as I had since even my first hand building class. And it has, it kind of led me into this painting that um, is probably one of the, the uh, one of my favorite paintings that I have to date. Um, and it kind of is a mix between this like more minimal approach and where I've, where I've gone before with painting. And again, uses the net, uses the checkerboard pattern and um, a lot of these reoccurring patterns that have become symbols to me um, and have come to like a new understanding through my community involvement here in Pittsburgh and my um, processing of myself. And so I wanted to just end on this painting and kind of read you all this statement that I wrote that feels um, resonant of where I am right now in my process and my understanding of what I'm doing. So here we go. There's a way that dimensions interlace between my vessels and paintings that activates the room. Color and form are expressed in a way that carries empirical processes into your day. The surface of the ceramic vessels exceed them past their own containment. Patterns add elusivity to the contained space that I create. I hope for the works to represent the liberation in going past the containment that oppressive systems hold us in. 
ambiguous dimension takes you on a walk through space and pushes you into gray areas between binary understandings. Moving into these areas takes play and experimentation, which are some of the bravest practices that we can be a part of. So that is my conclusion of my talk today. And I am open to hearing any comments or questions at this point and really appreciate you all um, being a part of this, this talk. Eva, would you like people to just unmute if they have a question now? Yeah, or whichever way feels more yeah. comfortable. I'm open to whichever. Cool. Do you want to talk maybe a little bit about, I know you use a variety of different materials, but it might be interesting to hear some of the materials that you really lean on both in painting and clay. Yeah, so I mean, with, I really just sprawl out like, um, that's like an obsession of mine is like, you know, if it's sitting on the table while I'm painting and it happens to be in the room, then I might try to throw it on the canvas. And so that can go from like definitely acrylic and oil um, and ink, chalk pastels. Um, I make sometimes paint out of clay, out of dry clay mixed with really any glue, but typically like acrylic medium. Um, and I can, you can even like build up this like sort of thicker synthetic clay paint um, by adding fillers into it too. I use a lot of mica and found objects like pieces of steel, chains, um, netting, uh, twine, um, like finished ceramic pieces. I have before like use the tops off of cups where I'm like, you know, just making an even lip of the cup. I'll save that top rim and fire it fully and use that as a, as a piece in the painting and sew it into the canvas. Um, but yeah, I really love to explore it all. Um, even like painting on top of ceramics, like I even, this is actually just sitting on my table right here, but like I have this vessel that was something that I made during quarantine and I glazed it and then just gessoed all over it. So I'm really just trying to like push what, what someone once told me that I could do with these materials and see what else is possible and, you know, pushing it to the point of being like, okay, like it's all, it's all about experimentation and trial and error and trying to include as much as I can and then take a step back and then jump back in and play with play with the materials. Um, I have a question. Um, I would say what so along the lines of that in your day to day when you are like interacting with these like objects that you things that you choose to bring into your space to be a part of your um, you know the stuff you pull when you are in the painting setting, like when you are in the painting setting, setting, you have this, this collection of objects that you're like, okay, I'm going to do this it's in my house already. But what about like when you're out, what speaks to you about the objects when you're out outside of your home and like what, how, what, I know that's a large question in a sense, but like what makes you want to take that home and like yeah. keep it in your arsenal or whatever, you know, your vocabulary. I think definitely some of those key things that draw me in are color and weight. Like I love being in Pittsburgh because of all the random steel objects that you can find, you know, as harmful as that has been to our environment. Um, like the weight of something, the material, if the material is like, you know, it might be, it might look like glass, but it's really plastic or like, this thing might look like I found the other day like this rusted piece of metal that's sort of shaped like a C and it's like rusted in this way that like looks like it's like a ceramic handle to a mug um so like form color like all of the things kind of that I'm like exploring with these material with clay and paint to begin with like form and color and like something that's like ooh, like if I 
had thought of this existing before I found it, maybe I would have represented this object in one of my paintings or like had tried to create it out of clay. So I would say those things. And also, you know, Lindsay, you know, we find a lot of things together and you're definitely an inspiration to that too. Hey, Eva, it was a really good talk. I have a question. What do you have planned in the next coming year? Like, do you have like any events or like anything going on with your ceramics? Yeah, thanks for the, for the answer. Well, I would say that one thing that I have going on right now is I have a giveaway on my Instagram, which if anybody wants to enter that, I have a small critique form that's very simple to fill out if you want to enter that small detail of something that's going on currently um but then also i am going to be joining the argyle pop-up who christine of union project is been a formative member of um has pretty much been the you know the backbone of forming um which is going to be in oakland it is part of expanding the oakland business district into becoming more than restaurants and including art and giving artists a space to show after this year of lockdown. So there's that. I'm also going to be at um, Maiden Found in Lawrenceville. I'm not exactly, can't remember off the top of my head where that location is, um, but that's going to be at the end of May and can be found on Maiden Found PGH's Instagram. Um, also, I'm beginning to form an at home studio. I'm going to be buying a kiln with my studio partner Tabitha and um, building a shed and putting a kiln in my backyard here in the north side um, and hopefully that will also lead to like a more community involvement with the space that I make and being able to teach outdoor class mini workshops and classes um, I would say that that is probably the extent of my plans that I know of as of now, but if anybody has any opportunities for me, feel free to send me an email or a DM. Also, if anybody is planning on participating in this a demo afterwards still open to taking questions but if anybody is um I just wanted to list out like a few materials if you're going to participate alongside me also is like still more than helpful if you're not going to but I wanted to show the materials that I have collected um just a little cup of water and some clay and I'm actually going to be forming these into balls as we get started but I have just a little bit of clay probably like you know you, you don't even need a whole pound of clay and then um if you can find something like I have this cork board and I also have this like foam craft mat thing but if you could find like some sort of material like a piece of cardboard or something just so you can have something that you're able to lift up off the table um but still open for questions if there's any more and appreciate the questions so far Hey, Eva, I have a question or maybe a comment, it's Jeffrey. Uh, thanks for sharing, it's great to kind of get more insight into your process and see more of your work together. Um, I think when I first met you, one of the things that I really responded to was just your paint, your paintings as well. And I think for me being at Union Project for several years as a painter, it's been really cool to see a, a ceramic artist bring so much painting into their work and seeing your show and how it continues like, they seem to not only connect like in your in your actual exhibits, the way you said you were like building and playing and experimenting even with those, but the way they inform one another in the way that like it looks like you're working things out and play on canvas two dimensions that look like three and then and then switching it and going to the three dimensions and messing around with, you know, how you're using the 2D on that. Like I really respond to that. I love that. And it's it's something I 
haven't seen much of at Union Project. So I'm just curious. I know there's some other artists on the, the call here too who are from the studio. Like what kind of influence that's maybe made and your conversations with others and. Yeah, well, I think like there's been a, a number of different spaces that I've been in that have been huge influences to that. And I would say like, definitely like, you know, just being in, I'm thankful to have gone to a school and studied art and like given an institution to really like dive into that through and had the access to different materials and mediums and facilities. And that was kind of like something that I automatically just always thought about in that space where like I'm traveling through different classrooms that are very much like designated to specific materials and like wondering like, where is the like mixed media? Like when do these things interact? And like going through a program where they pretty much want you to like designate yourself to a certain material. And like, um, it's just kind of always been something that I've pushed myself to do and have questioned. And then also being at places like Penland School of Craft too, and like craft environments and seeing different people work in different materials and be like enthusiastic about people trying new materials um, has also been a huge influence to me. And, you know, also seeing people's work like Lauren Mabry, who uh, just like creates awesome, like very painterly um, surfaces with her glazes. And I would say too, like one thing that got me interested in ceramics was before you know the art the work that I was making even before any of the things that I showed you I was like trying to create a paint scenario where the paint was doing the painting like mixing different materials and pouring them on a surface and seeing what the paint would just naturally do if I like set up the right cocktail for a, a different reaction you know and and then somebody said that, and then somebody at the same time was doing um was torching glazes onto sheets of metal and I was like whoa like this is different like glaze is you know kind of like that it's kind of like an unpredictable paint like you put it in this box of fire and it becomes something completely different than what you put in and so that was a major point too for me was like seeing people cross over these lines of materials and encouraging me to try different things um you know being in a space of multi is is like can be really groundbreaking for anyone I think um and so yeah that's why I'm like also so glad to bring painting into the space of Union Project and I think like taking steps into different materials than what you're used to or pushing your process in any way can you know allow you to think about the materials that you're working with differently um which for me is like really important thanks Eva. that's really cool mm -hmm. appreciate it well maybe if there's not any more questions We'll give a last little shout out and then I'll get the demo started. If anybody is going to do the demo and is like me and wears rings, now would be a great time to take off your rings. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna get started here on the demo. And one other tool that I did forget to mention that if you do have, it's not incredibly essential. This also, I didn't even really mention what this demo is gonna be, but I'm going to be leading you through pinching a cup. And it seems like a very simple kindergarten exercise, but we're going to get fancy with it. And I also do have this banding wheel here. 
if you don't have a banding wheel, it's like not the most necessary. The main purpose of me having this banding wheel is so that it's higher up so you guys can see what I'm doing. And also something that I'm thinking about too, just like thinking about the question that you asked Michelle was like, you know, the different materials that I work with. I will say like with my vastness of material exploration within paint and ceramics, like I use so many different types of clay and I really like, you know, I never am picking just one. So right here, I have this mix. It's like a, a mix of reclaim but it's mostly stoneware. You can see a little bit of the marbling in there. Um, I actually like really love using Reclaim because it's really plastic and it can sometimes subtly pick up on this little marbling, which is, it tends to be like another layer added to the surface. And so I just picked off a ball of this clay um, I probably, this is probably about a quarter to a third of a pound. Um, but you know, something that fits into the palm of your hand, sort of like this. And if you haven't wedged your clay, you know, maybe you want to wedge it. I'm going to say that I didn't wedge this clay. I'm just going to come out here and say that I didn't wedge it. And, you know, I think that that's okay. It has been okay in my experience because we pinch the clay so many times that any air bubbles that are in there, I did wedge it actually when I reclaimed it. So that is a little bit of a fib, but, um, you know, just kind of giving it like a nice little pat into a ball between your hands and getting some of the air out until you kind of come to this ball where there's not any like obvious creases you see how there's like some creases there i'm gonna like keep patting it on top of those creases until they come out but ultimately again we're just gonna like pinch this a lot so we're gonna get the air pockets out we don't have to be worried about it right Cool. And then I see Tabitha and Lindsay are working along me. If anybody else is like, needs more time, you know, wants me to pause, just like wave at me, you know, and I'm going to take some time and get another ball of clay ready while we all prepare. And like the reason why I'm like so drawn to pinching too is like, you know, thinking about the like universal, like the universal, like ancestral, like nature of this material is like everywhere in the world. Like people have been working with clay for so long and clay just naturally occurs in like pretty much every continent of the world. There's clay somewhere. And thinking about that and like the beginning times of me playing with clay, I was like, well, I would always come to the question of like, what would I do if I just like found clay and I didn't know anything about society? And I was just like trying to drink some water out of this cup, which I probably wouldn't have done anyways because it wasn't fired. But, you know, how would I drink water if I, didn't even know what a cup was and was just trying to create a vessel and knew I had to drink water and like really getting into this like kind of pre-society need very human need and like what would be the most like intuitive process to me and I feel like hand building really was that and that's kind of like a main reason why I was drawn more to hand building than than throwing 
and also it's just like a very forgiving process like in hand building and I also tend to work with things while they're still really wet um and that tends to have a lot of forgiveness with it um because you can just wait for it to dry a little bit and correct it later. So I have two balls of clay. One's a little bit bigger than the other, doesn't really matter. Um, and I'm gonna start off. Are you guys ready for me to make my first? Okay. So I'm gonna start off here with using my thumb. I'm holding the ball of clay like this with my thumb to the side. And I'm gonna kind of like imagine where the center of this is. And you know, you don't have to make any rash decisions. You can look at it and kind of think about it. And there will be moments for correction later, but I kind of make an imprint of like where the center of this ball of clay is. Um, and then just basically push into the center with my thumb and not too far, like, when you push in, you want to have, you want to feel on the back side of the ball and your thumb, like probably about that much space. Like if you feel once you push in between these two fingers, it's about this much space. And that's like really the biggest part about this process is like reading the space between your two fingers. And the more that you pinch, the more that you work with clay, you know, on the wheel or not, you're going to be able to like read thickness with your fingers more and more because, you know, your muscles have memory. And so you'll come out with something that's looking like this. It's a little bit like curved to the side. It's got a hole in it. It's basically already a cup. Just kidding. And so what I'm going to do from here is like, it's curved to this angle, right? So I'm going to come in with my thumb and start like creating a, a, a base at the bottom, like creating more of a circle in the, in the inside of the bottom of the cup. So using these four fingers and my thumb inside to pinch around a little bit of a base at the bottom. And if you feel yourself get too, you know, if you feel that there's less space in some areas between, or that they're, yeah, the, it's thinner in some areas between your fingers, then just press more lightly. Continue to like pinch between these fingers, but feel the thickness, feel where the thickness is and pinch there, you know, and you can pinch in areas around where it's more thin to bring clay to the thinner areas and pinch in the thicker areas um, to make it thinner. And then once we kind of get to this spot where we're like, okay, there's like a thinner area around this little circle. And then we have like a collection of clay usually like at the bottom of the cup. You can see that. And this is what the inside of it looks like. We still have a lot of clay here at the top. We're really just working on getting the bottom shaped right now. Oh, look at that, Audrey. You're doing great. And then we'll give this rim like a small little squeeze around. So like, just like slowly. And when you squeeze around this rim, you're gonna wanna like, when you squeeze, like move your thumb up like that. So you're kind of like gently guiding the thumb, the clay up with your thumb. This is a really crazy angle of my hand. I feel like I've never seen my hand look like this. My thumb bends way more than I thought it did. But yeah, slightly giving just like barely, like don't go extreme. And you know, the more that you do this, the more that you'll feel it out. But you know, feel where the thicker parts are and give those more of a of a squeeze than other areas. And if it gets a little cracky like that, that's okay. If you want, you could put a little water, but don't put too much. Don't wanna get it, it's, you know, when you get your clay too wet, you're gonna like 
it won't be able to retain its form. I feel like I see a lot of times people like in their first clay experiences just want to like dunk the clay in water. And it's like, whoa, slow down there. Like it feels really nice when you get it super wet and it's slimy, but then it won't hold the form and we need it to be dry to hold the form. And the more that it dries, the more it will hold the form and you can correct it too. So right now I'm at this stage. You see, it's not like centered really, like still really wonky looking. The, the bottom is not flat at this point and you can kind of see my imprints. You know, the, the rim has become thinner than it was. I definitely could pinch on this side more. You see how it's thicker but I'm not super worried about that right now. I just wanted to get it a little bit bigger so that I could put like three fingers inside of this. So the next thing that I'm gonna do, are you guys ready? Do we need, do we need a second? That's looking good. Okay. The next thing that we're gonna do is take this hand. It might be your left, it might be your right. For me, it's my left. And you're gonna put the bottom of this pot in your palm like that. See that? In the palm. And then you're gonna take these three fingers and you're gonna like slightly, I wish I could get this zoomed, this, this, I wish this zoom would zoom. Um, so you're gonna take your three fingers and sort of push from the center really gently. Push from the center of the, the, the base of the cup to the edge, like, like this. Like if this were my clay and this is the center, I'm going like this, but really lightly, like, like slowly coming out and then turning it and slowly coming out. Just moving that clay from the center where it's built up to the edges. And be careful that you're not creating too thin of an area anywhere. You know, you want to, like, it's okay if you have to do this, like, five times over to really get the clay to move. Um, you just want to, like, be gentle, not push too hard. But even if it gets too thin, you can make a clay Band-Aid. So, yeah, just pushing it out. And as you do that, too... you'll feel that the bottom is getting way thinner than anywhere else, which is fine. And it might get a little cracky on the bottom, which is also fine, because we'll address that later. We don't need to add water quite yet, because it's so thin too, if we add water right now, we might lose the form. That's the last thing that we want. So I've kind of thinned out the bottom and you can feel where it starts getting thicker here. Like if the bottom is like sort of even consistency. Also something that I do sometimes is just use one finger and just like gently like go in the inside like and go like this to the outside. Just stroking from the inside to the outside. And then also once I get to like the, you know, circumference of the circle that is the base of this cup, um, like once my finger comes up, I kind of use my thumb and pinch a little bit. So I'm also like thinning, getting the wall of this cup to a somewhat even consistency to the bottom of the cup, if that makes sense. Does anyone have any questions at this point? How do we how do we make it hard? <laughs> like what happens after? Did you get it wet? Yeah, we got it wet a little bit. Just just refrain from getting it too wet right now. Okay. And you can let it sit. And honestly, like if you let it sit, like maybe go through, yeah, just let, put it to the side and maybe get another ball of clay. Because once it dries a little bit, 
you'll be able to like work with the form a lot easier because if it gets too wet it'll be like it the walls want to naturally of any clay when you're building a vessel the walls are going to want to splay out so like if you get it too wet then it will just become a plate um, but not a cute plate yeah how, or it could be a cute plate depending on who you are how does it how does it become its final form if i don't have a kiln is what i'm asking you can give it to me and i'll figure it out okay <laughs> or you could rent space at the union project ah. <laughs> or take a class you know or come come sometime there will be a kiln in my backyard <laughs> on yeah. so any more questions how are we feeling I don't really have any, uh, I don't know if I, what my question is, but I'll show my pot. It looks great, Lindsay. But um, are the walls too thin? No, that looks good. Because you're going to even get them thinner. And then like, does the bottom, bottom feel, got, does the bottom feel thinner than the walls? No. Maybe get the wall, maybe get the bottom a little bit thinner. And it's honestly even okay if the bottom becomes like, broader like if the bottom becomes wider than the than the hole on the top then that's fine like but it needs to be thinner than the walls or as thin as the walls well those just looking at your walls like generally like you probably want those walls to be thinner at some point like I wouldn't pinch through the walls anymore because what happens if you pinch the walls before you like develop the bottom and the, um, the so what we're doing right now is developing the base of the cup so if we look at okay here's my cup from earlier today this is what we're creating is this not this is what i drank out of i didn't make this earlier today but yeah. we're making this bottom and then from there we're going to put the bottom here and then we're going to create the relationship to the wall to where it sits which for me typically is like a 90 degree angle. So I will like create that shape. And then from there, I'll pinch up and then even add a coil if I want it to be taller. So when you're, and also Lindsay, if you wanted to, you know, if your bottom's too thick, like you could carve some clay out of it later, or it's not that yeah. big of a deal, especially as your first cup, like, you know, you'll get it I, down. The more yeah, yeah, yeah. you just, it's muscle memory, you know, just like learning an instrument. Yeah. So I'm trying to make the inside flat as well. Like in I, there. Wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it being flat. Like that's why I would do it in the curve of your palm. Like you can like, and it's just easy to like get an even consistency just by like stroking your fingers in there and like feeling the thickness between your palm and like allowing the gentle strokes of your fingers inside like to create like a um like even consistency got it thank you yeah and it doesn't matter what the shape of the bottom is right now because we're about to like address that in this next step so i'm gonna go on to the next step everyone is ready or close to there and what I'm gonna do is so my my table is higher because I'm on this banding wheel but pretend that this is your table right here where hopefully you have a piece of cardboard or craft foam or something so that you can so that it doesn't stick to the table because or unless you're in a studio where you know the table is not a sticky surface but usually if you press the clay into a a table like it will stick to the table so that's the purpose of using this or the craft foam which looks like this you know like this stuff from kindergarten ac more and then you're going to take this rounded bottom and look at where are your walls thicker so my walls I kind of pinched up a little bit more on this one side, so they're a little bit thinner, but generally my wall's thicker over here. So with that in mind, I'm going to sit it down in somewhat the middle, but maybe um, 
press down a little bit more on the sides where the wall is a little thicker. And that's really not the most important thing right now, especially in these early stages, like if it's your first times hand building, like, so then I have it here, you know, a banding wheel is nice because you don't have to move it, but also if you have this, you can just use that to move it. But what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna attempt to try to get this camera in a place where you can see what I'm doing a little bit easier. So what I'm doing now is I'm pushing, I'm pinching here, but also pushing down a little bit. And like in the inside, in the inside, what I'm doing is using my index finger to meet my thumb and to create this angle of the relationship of the wall of the cup to the base of the cup. So a lot of my cups are pretty much, you know, straightforwardly meet the bottom, but you could do a, a number of things. You could create a curved bottom similar to what we just had and then put a foot, like another little element that it sat on. Um, you could create like a tinier bottom like this, like where it comes in you know, this cup here has a little bit wider of a bottom than the top, but still pretty much like meeting the base, meeting the, the floor. We call the walls, the walls, the walls of the cup. Then this is like the base and then you could add a foot to it. Um, but yeah, just using your pinching around and kind of pushing, the base on the inside down so that it meets the floor a little bit more, but you know, you're doing this gently and, and using your, your finger to finger measurements to also sort of correct the thickness in some areas where it's thicker than others. Um, and still really not worrying about the lip of the cup or any of that excess clay, really just worrying about the bottom of the cup. And also thinking about too, like, how big do you want the bottom of this cup to be? Also considering that the cup is going to shrink in the kiln, which some of us may or may not know. And, you know, this is probably a little smaller than I want my cup. So what I can do too is like push more from the inside and use the thumb on the outside to create, you know, pushing out from the inside, but also using the thumb to still maintain that relationship of the wall to the base of the cup. And there should be enough thickness on the walls at this point where you can um, sacrifice some of the thickness to create a wider base. And if you're moving your thing around as you do it, then you will create a circle, you know? and it will be a cylindrical form, which is, you know, the basic form that I make with a lot of the cups that I pinch is like pretty much aiming to begin with to be a cylinder. Um, and, you know, in ceramics, they often encourage you to be able to make a cylinder, whether you're hand building or throwing, because it's, it's a basis for a lot of forms, you know, especially as many of the forms that we make in ceramics are based around a circle, a cylinder is sort of our blank slate. It's our blank canvas. We can do a lot of things from there. So once you kind of have established the base of this cup and it feels like, you know, can you guys see that okay? You see how this relationship to the wall and the base has changed and still this has not been addressed, but this has kind of become this like straight wall. And if I was to lift up my cup, you know, it looks like the bottom of a cup. And if you wanted to also like, you could roll it at this point a little bit and create 
you know, if it's not super wet, don't do this if it's very wet. But you can kind of feel that it's, it's retaining its form somewhat. And if there's cracks on the bottom too, we can address that later. Because it's just not the best time to add water right now, unless it's literally like the smallest amount, you know, like your pinky is dipped in the water just like that. And then you put it on there. Sarah, what are you using? I only have Play-Doh. <laughs> <laughs> That's really great. <laughs> and it probably is working the same. You know, you could literally do this with like, I mean, not any material, but anything that's pretty squishy. Someone gave me Play-Doh, this is probably what I'd start doing. So if you feel inside of your cup, you probably feel an area where the wall starts getting thicker. And, you know, if we wanna really start developing the shape of this cup, then we're gonna have to start dealing with this thickness and thinning it out because that thickness is our material. And that's what we're gonna spread a little bit thinner in order to create this vessel. And you know, the, the perk of having this cup have thinner, um, you know, we don't wanna go too thin that where it doesn't retain its form. But the perk of having this cup have thinner walls is that it will be lighter. You know, like if you've ever picked up somebody's first mug that they made in the throwing class it's likely pretty heavy and you know maybe that doesn't matter maybe utility is not your main interest but you know people like something that's lightweight especially once you put um liquid in it but if it's too thick you can wait till it dries and also carve out of it so there's always a solution, it's very forgiving. And even if the cup 100% is not what you want, doesn't look good, then, <coughs> excuse me, you can reclaim the clay even. So nothing's done and said until you put it in the kiln. Even if it dries out, you can usually add moisture somehow. That's a really the main thing of why I love clay so much too, is it's like such a forgiving yet not material, you know? It's all about working with the time and the dryness. So I'm gonna start pinching up the walls now. I'm gonna start in this area where it's the thickest and also the lowest. And the motion that I'm gonna do is like, you know, it's going to take a certain angle of the camera for you guys to really understand this. So let me know if this makes sense to you or if you have any questions. But basically, yeah, I might have to like hug the computer. But can you guys see that okay? So you're taking your two fingers on both hands and your thumbs. And essentially the motion that I'm doing before I do it is like this. So I'm pinching up and in because as I said before, the motion that clay wants to go in is like outward. It wants to become a plate. It wants to be flat again because it came from the earth and the earth is flat. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but so I'm going to start doing that and really just start off doing it gently because, you know, you can always go around again and just kind of letting it move in a circle as you're doing that. And really starting at the base of the cup too is the most important where you start to feel the thickness from where you thinned it out at the bottom because you wanna move the clay from the bottom up. Otherwise it's gonna be really hard to like um, bring the clay that's down there up to the top once you've like made the top thin, um, unless you're gonna carve it, which is always an option. And so, yeah, just letting it, it's a little bit difficult to do this while I'm hugging my computer, but usually you wouldn't be doing that. So.
and you see how I'm also kind of smoothing out these areas that are little like not holes but like cracks in the clay um and we want to go around in a circle doing this and not not like attack one area with this method at once but like really like apply it around in 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 the round equally you know like even if one side is thicker like we want to really address it all around and then come back you know because if I pinch one side up then it's going to be like just uneven and a little bit harder to deal with sometimes I use one hand to pinch way more than the other depending on where I feel the thickness coming from and the whole motion with being able to like pinch up is like you know sometimes I'll be more like that if I feel more clay over here, I'll be like, Poop. but I'm still like pinching together because that's compressing the clay also. So our pinching and our pushing it together is compressing it. And that's also how we're getting out all these air bubbles, which also could be why we're seeing these little cracks and spots where the clay is sort of splitting open a little bit. And often if I have a spot that's like lower here, then I'll be using this side a little bit more and really like pinching into that height, the side with the height. Does anyone have any questions at this point with that part? Cool. Okay, I'm gonna keep going with that and, you know, can't see what my hands are doing as well right now, but um, let me know if you have any questions or need any guidance in this part. It's hard for me to even remember to not like go all the way in the spot that I'm at, but just keep turning it. The more that you turn it, the more evenness you'll have um overall and like an evenness in the height also which ultimately is corrected when we cut off the rim of the cup but evenness in the height um kind of also is a sign of this this piece of clay in this vessel being centered which is something that you'll learn about a lot more if you throw on the wheel it's like your piece of clay being centered you want the whole of the vessel to be centered in the ball of clay So I have a question, or just okay. if you have a lot of, um, I have a lot of a lot of cracks, or like on the outside, these little. Like, yeah, if that, it, they're getting, if they're getting, I remember you saying too that your clay was like pretty um, dry before, but yeah, um, it was. if they're getting like to be a lot, and you know, they're kind of you know, on the verge of maybe like having the whole vessel crack, then I would just like take your little bit of water and literally just like, so here's my water. Just like dip the tip of your finger in there. And even let it dry out and drip off for a second. And then just like really, you know, in one spot, like use that water to like smooth over that area. You just don't want to oversaturate it. And you can kind of see that that's happening here a little bit too on mine. But yeah, just using that and kind of like, you know, pressing, pressing and wiping with that water, but also bracing your press on the inside, you know, so that you're not just like, and pushing in. Because then you'll lose the form. Excuse my dog barking. So yeah, I mean, this, you know, kind of continues, we build a little bit more up. And the more that you do it too, like the more that 
you'll be able to take a smaller piece of clay. Yeah, look at that. See, and Audrey like modified the shape a little bit by creating these squared edges. That's something you can definitely do. Did you do that after it dried a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, see, once you let it dry a little bit, you can manipulate the form more. And a lot of times what I do when I'm like smoothing something out too is like have two fingers like this to brace the inside and then like use my thumb to really gently wipe it. And also, so like my, my rim is starting to like generally get dry. So I'm going to do, I'm going to do the water now, you know, just a little bit, just take one finger and just like literally really gently go around the rim of it. Like, I don't even have to smooth out the cracks, but just like do a tiny little bit of water just so it doesn't get too dry. And if there's any major cracks, then I'll smooth those out. Um, and just so it doesn't keep cracking more. And you see how this too is like, so this is a lot higher over here than over here. So again, just pushing this lower side into the higher side more than the opposite um, and trying to keep it from splaying out. And how we do that is really by pushing them, to, excuse me, while we're pushing like, up we're also pushing in and that's how you retain the cylindrical form rather than it's splaying out like i said before And so I feel like I'm starting to feel that this side's lower and this side is higher and also thicker. So what I'm kind of doing is like really gently at the rim of this cup, like pushing here, let me get this computer in a better angle again, but pushing this. So here it's, here it's lower right here. And this is thicker. So I'm pushing a little bit like you see how I'm kind of pulling up on this side while also pushing in on this side. So it's kind of like transferring the clay over a little bit. Okay. So this is getting kind of close to done here for me um, as far as the shape and, you know, it's about as high as I wanted to go for this amount of clay. And so I'm going to like kind of generally like spin it around, look at the shape. Does it feel like consistent? Like the walls are generally like, I'm definitely not going for perfection, you know, because you guys have all seen my work and it's very much not about creating a perfect um, perfection. You know, we've got all these pinch marks. We could cast a cup if we wanted it to be perfect, but we're pinching it. So there's gonna be some, you know, differences on the surface, some slight variation and um, that's okay.
because it has character. It was built with our hands. So yeah, I'm definitely aiming for like a more straight up and down wall, like a tumbler, little, little water cup, little iced coffee cup. Probably cold brew because it's pretty small. And yeah, like using these, this middle finger to brace the, the inside while I smooth out some of the cracks on the outside, but still I'm not even using water to smooth out these cracks. Because especially adding water right now, like it's a thin, it's a thin cup now. We add water, it's not gonna dry and hold its form. And also something to think about too, which you'll learn if you watch that little intro to clay YouTube video that I made um, that Audrey actually on this call helped me produce and helped film. Um, then you'll know that what happens when clay cracks is that it's shrinking. And so what shrinking is, is water leaving the clay. So as it dries, it shrinks. And as it goes in the kiln, it shrinks because there's more water being taken out. And when it, you know, so an evenness of moisture is gonna help reduce the possibility of it cracking. So yeah, I'm pretty satisfied where I'm at with this besides obviously the rim I've not addressed yet. And I haven't really like super looked in the inside yet because I'm kind of like, I kind of want to wait for it to really stiff up before I like go into the inside and smooth anything out. Um, because, you know, if I push in from the inside, it's going to be easy to affect the form. Um, but I could also use that to my advantage, you know, if I wanted to create some like texture, like I could do a little bit of this, you know, make a little, little con curve. I don't know how well you can see that little bump out there. Can you guys see that? So you could do like those little weird doopy things all over if you wanted to, you know, little spots where you're thumb or your finger to rest. If you wanted it to not just be a straight up and down cup, you could create some, some a uh, little bit of a different form with, with ways of pushing in and pushing out. But you know, the cylinder is just a really great canvas for um, manipulating what a cup could be, you know, creating more sculpture of a vessel, sculptural of a vessel. And also if cracks happen while you're making these little textural experimental spots, then I would just worry about those cracks later on. And a lot of time when I'm making these little things like, um, I use like my different steps of each fingerprint to like create these different layers of indentations and pushing out and you know pushing out with one finger versus in with the other will create a different effect. So just an option. Also if you do it and you don't like it then you can just kind of push it back together and 
you know, it might have a thinner area that you need to resolve, but just kind of using that push together and, you know, see kind of here, I kind of got a weird spot there now because one part's thinner. So what I would do is just kind of like pinch it together, you know, get it as even as I can, and then maybe take a little bit of clay, like this much, really small amount and really make it like a thin little pancake um, between my fingers. Even if it's a little dry when I do that, this is like a clay band-aid, what I would call a clay band-aid. And then, you know, you could get like a tiny bit of water on it like this. And a lot of times people would tell you that you have to scratch and score. Um, but this is a different clay class. Sometimes you don't have to scratch and score. So I'm just using this piece of clay that's already pressed into my finger and putting it here on this spot that's a little weird. And the water has already allowed that to adhere to the surface. And I'm just gonna really gently like smooth it out on the sides. And you know, there's a possibility that an air pocket could be created there, but we're gonna also pinch over that area to ensure that it's compressed and the possibility for an air pocket is reduced. And you know, people worry about air pockets if you guys don't know, because it's a possibility for something to explode in the kiln um, because an air pocket can hold moisture. And when you put something in the kiln, it, um, you know, it goes beyond boiling temperature. So the reason why we have to let things dry before we put them in the kiln is because, um, we, you know, the moisture, if it goes into boiling temperature and there's still moisture in the clay, then we know that water boils at a certain temperature, which if that water is contained inside of the walls of our vessel, then that's how we get an explosion. I'm just kind of adding a few more little details here and there. Okay. And then what I'm gonna do with this is like, typically I would wanna let it dry out. And then, um, you know, I would probably start working on another another cup at that time, maybe even do a few more cups. Um, I think I'm gonna refrain from my continuing to cup make because of our um, dwindling time, but I would let this dry. And then I would take like a, an X-Acto knife, which I have over here somewhere. And I wouldn't do this now if you guys can wait to, till it's a little bit more stiffed up. But I'm gonna show you what you would do. It's, and it's just basically like creating an, an even lip here. Um, so I like to start at the lowest point. Like you see that this is lower on this side than this side. You can barely tell. It's a little more obvious to me over here. But yeah, this side is higher. So I'm gonna start at what looks like the lowest point. And during this part, it is helpful to have like a banding wheel, but you know, definitely just use this, this surface that you're letting the cup sit on to um, turn it as you do this. Um, but just at first tracing the line that we're gonna cut at, um, especially if you do it while it's still kind of wet, that's gonna help you uh, to, you know, not make any rash decisions that affect the form, but everything can be reversed mostly. And so what I'm gonna do is like, try and brace my arm at the edge of the table or somewhere, you know, whether it's your wrist right here, but try to brace your arm so that you're really just like keeping your hand at this height. You know, you want to maintain the same height and then 
turn your cup around. And you can even trace that line sometimes two times before you make your cut. Okay. So I've made this line all across the top. You guys can see that. Can you guys see that? And then I'm going to take the X-Acto knife and kind of come in at it because this like, <clears throat> this line has already been made, you know, it's already partially cut. Um, so I'm gonna come at an angle in with the X-Acto knife like this and meet that line that I made. And this will also be easier once your cup is dried a little bit or retain, you know, a little bit dry. I think also if any of you guys are new to clay, like watching that intro video will help because it will explain different levels of dryness and, um, where you would want to cut this like a little bit before leather hard. You see, I just cut off the rim. So now we've got a little bit of a more even, you know, it's still not perfect, but there's still another step. So at this point, I'm going to take my two fingers and for like a comfortable drink, typically you want the rim of the cup angled so that there's an angle on the inside and a straight up nature of the outside. So like, you know, like maybe like, it depends on how thin your the rim of your cup is, but like, you know, if you had a thick wall, you would maybe see like a 45 degree angle that met the wall that was straight up. But, you know, we're not working with that much thickness, so it's gonna be less apparent. And then, so when you're pinching the, this freshly cut rim, you're gonna go like this and you're gonna use your thumb to create that angle while the ac exterior maintains this straightness. And just be really, really gentle. And also trying to use the clay to kind of create a more even height. If you see any cracks in there, don't worry about it right now. So we will come back to it. And it even has splayed out the like rim of the cup a little bit, which, you know, could be aesthetically what you want or not. And if it does that, then you can just kind of correct it by coming out and pushing, pressing more on the outside. There might still be some unevenness. And if you see that, like, and you're like, oh, that's like a little dip in the cut that I made and it doesn't look quite right. What you can do is try to pick up some like thickness from the bottom and just pinch it. And that can like bring that evenness up, you know. And also we're gonna do one more step, which is kind of gonna be a little bit of a pain to do at this wetness level. Um, but I'm gonna do it for the purpose of this demonstration. But ideally you would wait for this to be a little bit drier, you know, even like, you know, you could even do this state at bone dry if you really wanted to, but you would wanna be very careful if you waited that long. Because when it's bone dry is the most fragile state. When your clay is all the way dry is the most fragile state that the clay is in. So, I'm gonna kind of sit up here a little bit. I have my cup of water. 
and I'm gonna get these two fingers in the water. Just dip them in and then use again this thumb as my angle and just like turn. So here, I'll get this computer in my hug position. So I'm actually gonna <coughs> So if you guys can see that, okay. I'm going to take my finger at this angle where I'm maintaining the straightness on the outside and just like, you know, give it a nice little wipe, kind of getting the finger mint marks off of the, the rim of the cup. It's pretty difficult to do right now because it's like the wetness is affecting the form, but you know, generally just want to show you guys how we smooth out that, that rim. And also at this point where there's like unevenness too, you can Correct it. Just careful not to put too much water. I think I just did that. And so usually I'm looking for like, I can see where there's the cut mark, but there's this line of the ridge on the outside and the ridge on the inside. And I'm trying to meet those two those two ridges to make kind of this smoothed, like rounded over top. This part also is definitely easier to do if you have a banding wheel and kind of like, you know, going back, looking at the full form, you know, the more that you turn it to, you maintain a similar angle of the lip of the cup all over. And then, you know, it gets like a little bit slippy, like there's these little, so you wanna like wipe off your finger and use your like more dry finger to kind of get rid of some of that excess slip and create a more rounded edge rather than like a point. Yeah, that's essentially my cup right here. It's pretty wonky looking. And it's fun to have these like crazy shapes because, you know, and these like ridges and texture um, because the glaze can really accentuate those parts. And, you know, if you use multiple glazes, it can really become a composition. And then, you know, when it's also drier is when I would come out and like look at the bottom of the cup and smooth out any wrinkles on the bottom and on the, this edge. And then when it was dry again, I would look in the inside. I'm not gonna do this right now because it's kind of, uh, you know, it's gonna really affect the form if I put my huge hand in there and then, you know. But you'll see maybe at the bottom, like if you have long fingernails, you might have some fingernail marks. Um, there's some stuff to smooth out in there and you can use your finger. You could also use like a little wooden sculpting tool and kind of smooth them out, but just be so, so gentle. And even if you wanted to get your little wooden sculpting tool a little bit wet and go in there, um, that would probably be helpful. You have some cracks that you think, you know, really need a patch. You can definitely do like a little pinch off of your clay ball and um, 
if your clay ball got a little wet, then you can just kind of grace it with a little bit of water and put it back and flask it. Mine got a little wet. Ooh, very cool. Cool. So I feel like that concludes sort of my lesson. If anybody was making something they wanna show, that would be really cool. Um, but if you're shy about it, that's okay too. If anybody has any questions, then these are all looking great. We could have a cup parade. <laughs> so cool, look at that texture. So many possibilities with the clay. Did you have a question, Lindsay? Oh, you're cracking. So if you have that cracking, you can just use your use your knife. Do you have an exacto knife, Lindsay? Somewhere. Yeah. Right here. Or even just a kitchen knife. Oh. You so should I just cut off like below the cracks, maybe? Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. That might be an easier way to handle it. And also if you want. If you want to add a coil too, I don't think we have enough time to do the coil demo, but if you want to, we can have a private session for $30 an hour. <laughs> hey, thank you. I'm just kidding. I'll, I can show you how to do a coil um, if you like. And, you know, yeah, just cut off below those cracks and, you know, even if you wanted to get it wet, if you had a spray bottle with water and wanted to cover it with plastic and sit, let it sit for a little while, that might be helpful too. Cool. Okay. Well, I feel like that might be the conclusion of what I have to say here. Maybe I'll hand it off to you, Michelle, to do some concluding uh, remarks. Sure. Yeah, um, I would like to just say thank you, Eva. It's been really delightful to hear about the artwork that you've been creating throughout your career and hear more about the thought process you're putting into those pieces. Uh, I'm excited to see where your work goes next um, and appreciate you making your demo so interactive. I think that was super fun. And before we leave for today, I did want to take one more minute to thank again our sponsors and funders. We're grateful to the Fine Foundation, Bridgeway Capital, the Creative Business Accelerator, Simpson and McCready, and Standard Ceramics Supply. And of course, Union Project is a rad asset. We're partially funded by the Allegheny Regional Asset District every year. So we're grateful to them. And then as Eva already mentioned, you can follow her on Instagram. I would encourage you to do so at Deposit Unknown. And please take some time to go check out the studio video she created. It has been posted on Union Project's YouTube channel. And as I mentioned earlier, we've got uh, just about 24 hours left on the Mother of All Pottery Sales online shop. You can browse pottery made right here in Pittsburgh at union-project.square.site. Uh, and if you would like to purchase anything, it will be available for pickup locally. And then if you are so moved to help Union Project create more ceramic programming just like this, this you can donate to us online, unionproject.org support. We are, of course, grateful to all of the individuals that help make our work possible every year. And with that, I think we are wrapped up for today. So once again, thank you, Eva. Yeah, thank you all so much for joining. I really appreciate it. And I uh, hope to see you all out there in the real world mm -hmm. and make clay things together. Awesome. All right, folks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah.